welcome to lecture 32. So, today I will briefly go through what I did the last time and uh, pick up from there on the simply type lambda calculus. So, we just looked at what is wrong with the untyped lambda calculus. Firstly, there is a type confusion. Often you do not know whether you are applying k to the right argument or not. For example, I mean you might be asking is true, is 0 true? I mean, so then are you applying k or true to 0 and 1 maybe, right. So, there is some type confusion, but that is not so serious. A slightly more serious problem is that uh, constructors and deconstructors are not inverses. So, which means that unless you cannot apply deconstructors, I mean if you apply deconstructors onto some arbitrary term which was not explicitly constructed through a constructor, then you, you might get some result and you would not know whether the result is wrong. So, that is that is one thing. Uh, and so, and the question is one, one problem, one thing is to find out where the culprits are, I mean who the culprits are. One possible thing is to actually look at this very general purpose language definition and see whether everything in it is really meaningful. I mean maybe what, what one should do is maybe one should restrict the language somehow, so that only really meaningful things uh, are actually used. I mean this is, uh, I mean this is something that is uh, quite natural even in uh, natural languages. I mean, uh, so, uh, so one thing is that one of the reasons for uh, meaninglessness if you like. I mean if you, if you were to actually apply this lambda calculus as a calculus of functions to some data type, apply it somewhere, then one thing that really does not seem to make much sense and which mathematicians over thousands of years have are agreed upon is for a function to apply to itself or for something like this. So, what happens with things like this is that they complicate matters in more ways than one. I mean one thing is that they do not actually seem to mean much. <coughs> Secondly, if you remember with, with such replicating combinators, I mean you could have other, other replicating combinators. For example, I could define a combinator like this, which will just keep making three copies and somehow applying them. or like this, which will make four copies and somehow apply them pairwise and so on and so forth. I mean there is an infinite number of such combinators that one can form. And the thing is that it does not seem like we can actually give a decent meaning to all of them. So, one possibility is to actually try to restrict the language, so that somehow you get only meaningful combinators, meaningful lambda expressions, which are really, which really have the potential for being functions, which can be applied on in a general sort of fashion on maybe some data types or some other uh, uh, system, symbol pushing system and thereby get a decent model of computation. So, and another thing of course, is that because of the non-deterministic nature of beta reduction, uh, some some of these the even if you were to try to extract a meaning the meaning does not seem to be intrinsic it seems to be computation dependent so one example that i gave before was of uh, this right i mean if you take this combinator k and apply it to x and omega uh, in this fashion then you have one in a, a one step beta normal form which is just x uh, or you can do an infinite number of steps reducing this omega to itself, right. Okay. So, if you were to take, uh, I mean this omega reducing to itself is only the, uh, more the simplest of complications. I mean if, if instead of this omega I actually took this other combinator which replicates things three times, then I will get an explosive computation where no two terms are identical, right. I mean let me call that little omega, let me say little omega is this, then I could take this combinator like this 
and then if I try to do k x and little omega, what I'll what will happen is I'll get k x omega omega omega. Uh, <coughs> apply to itself. Uh, apply apply uh, so ap apply it to itself. Right. So let me. So if you were to consider something like. So, if you take omega applied to itself, what you get is omega, omega, omega and this can go in various directions depending on how you want to do the application it and various and all of them will just keep multiplying copies of this little omega. So, when you take this k x omega, uh, omega, then there is one normal form which is directly obtained otherwise you get these explosive computations where k x will be preceding each of them and all these do not seem to really uh, have some meaning. So, one possibility is to actually try to get rid of them. So, so one, one other complication they come up with is that they yield infinite computations even when there are actually beta normal forms right. So, uh, so let us go back to our basic mathematics and we have a simple typing scheme of this form right. And of course, remember that we have to look at values and functions as far as possible equally. There is an important result in the theory of computation which says that uh, there is no general algorithm to decide whether two given functions are the same or not, but, but, but there is an algorithm to decide whether two given values are the same. But however, notwithstanding that as far as is possible we would, we would like to give them equal status. So, so one possibility is to unify the notation in this fashion and actually put a check on the construction of terms so that they are well typed right. So, and then similarly put a restriction that lambda abstraction must be a function that is in some sense ready to be applied okay. And the lambda abstraction is actually something that was that somebody should have discovered probably long ago since mathematicians are using such notation yeah. So, this kind of a typing uh, scheme leads us to firstly a language of types which allows higher order functions. So, we could for example, start with a finite collection or even an infinite collection of base types if you allow various kinds of pattern formations like this. <coughs> And let us for, for simplicity assume that we have a finite collection of base types and we could define a language of type constructions okay. So, so this, this language allows us to construct functions of the form int to int, int to bool, bool to int, bool to bool, int to int the whole thing going to int to int, int to int going to bool and so on and so forth it allows all these kinds of constructions yeah and uh, one one easy thing to prove is that every uh, type is really of this form this can be proved by induction on the structure of the <coughs> induction on the production rules of this grammar on types okay now so what we'll do is put this typing on top of the lambda calculus somehow so one thing is that we'll uh, we will define this simply type lambda calculus as one in which types of variables especially bound variables are specified. And if you if you look at a complete program as one which has absolutely no free variables okay. So, free variables will only appear as sub programs uh, only in sub programs. Similarly, if you take a complete lambda expression as a function then there should be no free variables, all the variables should be bound. So, only sub terms can have free variables right. So, and of course, this notation is analogous to our standard set notation where actually this is like a typing constraint and for example, considering if you define the set of all numbers which are even okay, I mean even does not make any sense with uh, I do not know with real numbers uh, or, or uh, let us say with complex numbers and so on and so forth. 
So, it makes sense with natural, so you put a type constraint on the numbers, right. I mean this is, this is a very common practice and we just follow that practice and co construct the simply typed lambda calculus in this with this two level syntax. One level syntax is for the type language using the base types and the other level syntax is for the actual lambda expressions, right. And now the important thing is I can actually determine the types of various lambda expressions statically. So, we will define a context as a collection of variable to type bindings and we will call this this a static environment, okay. The reason for calling it static is that whatever we are going to do is something that can be determined at compile time, it does not require runtime checks. Whether a certain lambda expression has a well within quotes a good type is something that can be determined by a compiler without executing the program, right, okay. So, so that is why the word static, whenever in, in any in anything to do with programming languages and compilers if the word static is used it means it is something that can be done before execution at translation time or at compile time. If it is an interpreted language it is still translated, you can do it before execution. Whatever can be done before execution is said to be static. Otherwise, whatever can be done only at run time is dynamic, yeah. So, <coughs> we can construct a collection of such bindings and essentially this context is what constitutes the symbol table that the compile, I mean the symbol table that a compiler constructs has this context as an essential part of the symbol table, I mean the types of the various identifiers and so on, so, yeah. So, an essential part of the feature of the symbol table which is really a static environment as opposed to a dynamic environment which is the activation record stack and so on and so forth, okay. So, an essential part of the symbol table is really type checking and it is all something that can be done at compile time without actually running the program, yeah. So, this, so whatever we do is something that can be done at compile time. So, let us look at the type environment and uh, we can give actually inference rules of this form. So, uh, we have to look at, uh, we should, uh, we should look at type inferencing of course, in a structurally inductive fashion, right, going down the syntax tree somehow. So, when you go down the syntax tree, even if you started out with a program which had uh, no free variables, when you look at sub expressions in the sub programs then there are bound to be free variables in that context. So, so we will assume that there exists a context. So, for a fully defined program, for a full program, especially a program which does not use library routines and so on and so forth, a complete program actually starts with an empty type environment, just like often it starts execution in an in an empty environment uh, with an empty activations record environment, yeah. So, during the process of compilation you will be collecting a lot of type information about the variables. So, for a, so whenever there is a reference to a variable, okay, you look into your type environment. If the type environment has a type specified for it and that then that is the type of this variable, right. So, it is essentially you just access the symbol table and see whether that variable was already declared. And if it was declared uh, in all languages which insist on declarations preceding use, if it was declared then there must be a type information unless it is a forward reference in which case it has to be back patched later. But in general the symbol table should contain the type information if declaration precedes use. In the of course, there are implicit declarations and so on, but let us not worry about it. Let us live with this, the, uh, le, the, the, the most of them are otherwise algorithmic aspects which have not, nothing to do with the system of typing. And then uh, now we would say that this application is well typed and actually has a type tau only provided L has a type sigma arrow tau for some sigma and m has a type sigma. Essentially what you are looking at are 
something akin in mathematics to domain and range information, domain and codomain information. So you, if, if there is a function from natural numbers to natural numbers, then it has to get an argument only uh, which is a natural number. So you insist that all applications are meaningful only if the argument to an application, the operand is of a type that is consistent with the domain of the operator, right. And if it is so, then you, you can infer the result, the result is whatever you will get in the code domain, right, it is as simple as that. And uh, for in the case of a lambda abstraction, you insist that it has to be a function because it has a bound variable which is somehow going to be replaced by a beta reduction through a function application, which means a pure lambda, a lambda abstraction should actually represent a function. I mean its type must be something which contains an arrow, it cannot just be a base type, a lambda abstraction cannot be a base type, it cannot be, you cannot have a lambda abstraction which is of type int, okay. it has to be a function from something to something. So, but however, if you go about things in a structurally inductive fashion, assume that the body of the lambda abstraction has a type tau, then this lambda abstraction is really a fun and if x is been declared as being of type sigma, then this lambda abstraction represents a function which goes from sigma to tau. So, which takes arguments in sigma and gives you results in tau and so that is and the important thing about all this is that there are no executions involved, it is all something that can be done by a compiler as part of the that is why most of the typing information is done at compile time. There is absolutely nothing at runtime that is necessary for such things, yeah. So, having done that, uh, so and, 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 the, and the static environment is very much like the dynamic environment, you are doing temporary updations because you will have newer and newer declarations with newer, uh, newer uh, with bound variables. Uh, with with bound variables being redeclared, I mean you'll have newer declarations maybe for the same identifiers. So you have to temporarily update your environment so that you you know what are the, what is local and what is global, and these things are all meant to be local. So you the static scoping rules are in force. So you require this temporary updation because of static scoping rules. Yeah, so. So these rules actually tell you what a well typed term is. So I would say, so we would say a term is well typed in a context lambda, in a context gamma provided it is possible to infer its type by the application of rules T1, T2 and T3 a finite number of times. Remember that these are rules and they have to be applied only a finite number of times, otherwise um, your compilation will be a non terminating process. Yeah, if it requires an infinitary proof, then your compilation itself is going to be non terminating. Forget about executions, even your compilation is going to be non terminating, which you do not want, right. Okay, so, so the next question is have we actually achieved the purpose? I mean, have we banned combinators like delta? Yeah. And uh, so let us look at delta itself and try to see whether by applying these rules T1, T2 and T3 we can actually we can actually infer a type or what can, what, hack, what actually happens. So, so let us uh, let us assume given an arbitrary context gamma and so supposing delta were of type since it is a lambda abstraction it could quite well be of a type sigma arrow tau for some sigma and tau in terms of the base uh, types. Right. So, but delta could be of type sigma arrow tau if and only if the body of delta which is x applied to x is of type tau. Okay. Now, x applied to x could be of type tau only if this x were of type rho arrow tau and this x were of type rho 
I mean otherwise how would the application be meaningful right. So, so now what so what you are embarking on is going down as deeply as possible in order to infer a type I mean you are trying desperately hard to give delta a type and the conditions the constraints you are getting are this. So, I can infer a type for delta only provided I have x of type rho arrow tau and x of type rho both in the same and uh, static environment right. Now, this thing is possible only if this sigma is equal to rho arrow tau and sigma equals rho. So, which means that you see after all it is possible that these things look deceptively different, but they might be actually solvable as being equal. I mean how do you know they are not solvable ok, but when you when you do this when you get it in this form what you see is that when you do the substitution essentially what you are trying to do is you are trying to unify these two terms and in order to find a solution in fact a most general <coughs> unifier. So, when you try to do this what happens is that you just keep expanding out infinitely and if you if and this this keeps on expanding in this fashion infinitely and your tau has is not yet been fixed to a base type int or bool. Remember that our language of types was such that every type that is in that is valid is something which will have a last thing which is a base type. You have not yet been able to infer what is the base type tau which you are getting every time in in every unfolding of this equation. Okay. Now, so therefore, th this inference is going to go on infinitely. So, without an infinite proof one cannot infer a type for delta okay. and of course, even after an infinite proof I do not know what the type is. Okay. So, this which is impossible here which I have, uh, is really to be read as something that whatever may be its type it is not inferable in a finite proof. Right. So, so now assume that so uh, the the point about uh, uh, the, the point about unification of course is that I went about it in a rather simplistic manner, but the unification algorithm is deterministic and it will clearly point out that this is impossible. Equating these two is actually impossible. Any unification algorithm will be able to point that out. Right. So, it would not even go through an unfolding, it would not even look upon it as a recursive definition which is to be unfolded, it will it will look upon it as an equation which is to be solved by a most general unifier and it is impossible to get that most general unifier ok, because the disagreement sets are such that one is a subset of other ok. So, when the disagreement sets are like that then you know that you are not going to be able to solve it that is how a unifier would actually look at it. So, it is actually compile time feasible to detect that delta cannot have a type assigned to it, it is not necessary to go through an infinite unfolding process. But uh, logically speaking from the point of view of rules what it really means is that you cannot infer in a finite proof the type of delta yeah. <coughs> so, so that is how the simply typed li uh, lambda calculus goes and what we will do is, so we will just look <coughs> upon the language now that the, the the grammar for the types itself puts the appropriate restriction the inference rules put the restriction on the kind of terms which can be executed. So, what it means is that your if you put in a typing inferences engine with a unification algorithm in your compiler the compiler will just throw out all those terms and say impossible not uh, the type cannot be determined and therefore, it will not even permit execution, it will not generate code to execute. So, we will just look upon the simply type lambda terms as all the well typed terms of generated by the two level grammar of types and um, and the lambda calculus yeah. So, and of course, we just have to complete a few formalities, we have to define what is beta reduction and we should define beta reduction in such a way that it is well typed 
So, if now this, this portion is not part of the language, but this is what the compiler has inferred. Whatever is in light blue is really part of the language okay, of the simply typed lambda calculus, but by, by an application of the rules of inference, assuming that L is a term of type tau, what your, what your uh, type inference system will produce is that this lambda abstraction is of type sigma arrow tau and then assume that it can, it also and only if it can, the argument that you give to this application, only if that is of type sigma will it actually perform a beta reduction. So, so whatever is in dark blue here is really something that is, that is actually not part of the language, but is something that is part of your type inferencing system, which is again a part of your compiler or your translator for the language. Okay. So, the actual terms are those that are given in light blue. So, given an application of the form lambda x colon sigma bar L applied to M and assuming that this type inferencing system can assign these types to them through the application of the rules T1 to T3, then a beta reduction is possible which will give you a term of type tau. Yeah. And uh, what we can do is you can carry these, uh, uh, carry these definitions forward just as we did before. I mean you can define the many step beta reduction, equality on beta. Now when you do equality on beta, it is it's guaranteed that you can never equalize two terms which do not have the same type. Okay. After all they should both be beta reducible to a common term and so all the, all the terms in your beta reduction should have the same type, all the steps in your beta reduction should have the same type. So that is, so that is implicitly guaranteed once you go through a type inferencing system. Yeah. So and of course uh, and the interesting thing is that since delta and omega are not well typed and they are thrown out by a type inferencing system, you are also not going to get these horrible infinite com beta computations. Okay. Actually there is, there is a caveat there, that does not mean that with a type inferencing system you can guarantee that every program terminates. You cannot guarantee that every program is an algorithm. It is only guaranteed for the type lambda calculus with base types which are not actually applied to some things like numbers. The moment you bring in numbers, uh, we can, we can we can really sit together and design a really lousy definition which will run forever. Okay. But, the in, but the thing is if you remove functions on numbers and you look at only the type, the simply type lambda calculus with this beta reduction with all these replicating terms out, there are going to be no infinite beta reductions. Infinite computations do come in the moment you apply it onto some other domain like numbers, but with just using this base types intent uh, bool or whatever as patterns and not actually using any integers or booleans, just looking at the lambda terms without actually doing number computations. I mean do not do not bring in piano arithmetic nothing, just use this intent bool as uh, patterns for possible values just look at pure lambda terms, there will be no infinite computations because you, you have outlawed all these kinds of terms which have the potential for replication. Okay. So, so that is actually, so what, what happens is, so in this, in the type lambda calculus what, what it means is that then beta reduction is strongly normalizable, means you are always guaranteed. Coupled with the fact that, coupled with the fact that uh, beta reduction is Church-Rosser, what it also means is that there are unique normal forms. If something is Church-Rosser and it has two different terms, 
then they should they should be able to meet at a common term by the diamond property which means you will have a unique normal form if, because if you have two different distinct normal forms which are not mutually alpha convertible then by the church rosser property it says that there is there is a common computation which they should both meet no. so you cannot have two distinct normal forms these are some of the nice properties that come out of type checking and type inferencing yeah so so let's just <coughs> so let's so one so the let's let's look at let's look back at what we have done so one thing is that when you do simple types the type inferencing can be done entirely at compile time uh, or translation time in the case of interpreted languages can be done at translation time before you actually perform any kind of executions yeah and the second thing is that there are no replicating or self applicative combinators in this new language and therefore those horrible infinite computations are uh, are outlawed and uh, 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 the type inferencing of course is done by structural induction which in in practical terms in terms of a parser and so on means that you will do it through a recursive descent parsing technique if your compiler is implemented by a recursive descent parsing technique then you will do it through that if it's if it is some other parser like a table driven parser or something then in the table you can also incorporate these rules for the appropriate productions yeah. So, and then so and all these horrible combinators which complicate life are removed on the basis well they are really meaningless things and they are really complicating life and they are all since they cannot be typed the unific unification algorithm will produce failure the unification algorithm within the type inferencing system which is within the compiler will will produce will actually produce a failure so the type inferencing system will actually produce a failure because of that and the compiler can just throw these programs out without generating code yeah so so the simple typing uh, the simply type lambda calculus that we have looked at basically starts with the assumption that no term which contains either self application or a form of replication can be well typed and therefore anything that is built up on top of self applicative or replicating terms cannot be well typed I mean after all by structural induction unless you can type the innermost terms you cannot type the outermost terms. So, if this omega and delta and so on are embedded deep inside a huge lambda term your recursive descent parser will go up to the omega or lambda and keep coming up from the recursion and produce a failure ok. So, so which means and then and the other, the other nice thing is once you have put in a type discipline ok you cannot apply arbitrary deconstructors to arbitrary objects ok. So, then your constructors and deconstructors will actually be inverses. So, a deconstructor will be applicable only if its argument is something of a constructed type of this of a of the corresponding constructor type and the constructor will be applicable ok to whatever only provided the elementary objects from which it constructs are of the appropriate types. So, then you can actually once you have constructed these things you can keep applying these constructors and deconstructors as long as your compiler allows them you are guaranteed that they are they are meaningful right ok. So, so now let us look at beta normal forms. So, beta normal forms since there are no infinite computations unless you actually give really lousy definitions all computations at least of the pure simply type lambda calculus are guaranteed to terminate. Computations of the applied lambda calculus in fact any any calculus which incorporates natural numbers as a data type 
means that it has a potential for infinite computations. Okay. So, only in the pure uh, simply typed lambda calculus is it guaranteed that there are going to be no infinite computations. The moment you apply it on something like you moment you give these definitions over an applied term which are we, we, moment you, uh, you give bad recursive definitions you are going to get infinite computations. Okay. Right. So, and then since beta is church rosser uh, unique normal forms exist and you can always find them for the pure simply typed lambda calculus. Okay. So, now let us look at what, what does a pure simply typed lambda calculus term look like you know what are the what are some of the meaningful terms right. So, uh, what you will find is okay. So, let us look at some some of the simple combinators we cannot use omega and delta and and so on uh, and terms like that, but we can use some simple things like you can use k, you could use the identity, you could use s uh, such. So, if let us look at the identity function over these two base types integers and bool right. So, let us look at this. So, the identity function in the simply type lambda calculus over integers will look like this and your type inferencing <coughs> system will since when it goes down it collects this information that x is of type int then when it gets down to this x this free variable x it gets the information from the context that it is of type int then when it comes up again since it is a lambda abstraction it pronounces this to be of type int arrow int. Okay. So, the identity function is an integer identity function. So, basically what it does is if you give an integer argument to it, it will return back the same integer argument and that is all yeah. But the point about this is supposing you give a boolean argument to it, then it will throw it out because it cannot because it is of a wrong type, it does not satisfy the conditions of the beta reduction. Right. So, if you give uh, remember that even if you use the lambda calculus representation of numbers and booleans you will use different you will have to include type information on all the bound variables there. So, you cannot give a boolean argument to this function and expect to get any answer it will not it will not type check the beta reduction cannot be enabled because it expects an argument of type integer and you are giving it an argument of type boolean and it will throw it out right. So, which means what what the good thing about that is you cannot for example, ask questions like whether 0 is true right. But So, what what does it mean supposing you want an identity function on booleans what it means is you will have to have a different combinator like this. Now, what applies to the identity function also applies to other complicated functions. Point is that they should all be well typed. And what happens to the boolean? Now, what, what if I want an identity higher order function which takes a lower order function and returns me the same function? In general, what if I want a combinator which transforms one higher order function into another higher order, higher order function like, like derivatives for example? the derivative is a higher order function which takes a, a function and gives you another function right. So, here I am taking identity as the example, but it could be any of those functions. The point is that they are not going to be type checked unless the arguments and the functions are of appropriate type. So, supposing you take a higher order function for which you want a higher order identity function, but you cannot take any arbitrary higher order function. You have to take let us say you take a higher order function of type int arrow int then you have you have to have a special identity function for int arrow int if you have a function from into bool then you require a special identity function from into bool so for example this this combinator accepts only arguments of the form which have the type int arrow bool that means which are functions which so it accepts as arguments this is a higher order common a higher order function which accepts another function whose type is int arrow bool and gives you back the same function right. 
So, if you want int arrow int, you will require another combinator. If you want int arrow bool arrow int arrow bool, then you will have require yet another combinator and so on and so forth. So, which means for every type tau and there are an infinite number of such types because it is a context free grammar on the on the language of types starting from even to even from a finite set of base types, I can construct an infinite number of types which means even for a simple function like the identity function, I require an infinite number of identity functions in order that my type checking actually works. Right? So, that is that is what happens. So, which means what, what we looked on as in the untyped lambda calculus, if you look at all the combinators which can somehow be ascribed types with the new with the type system. So, for every combinator C which for which you can ascribe a type, there are actually infinite number of typed versions of that combinator and only the appropriate typed version should be applied to the appropriate argument. So, if you had a combinator C like K for example, the combinator K in the untyped lambda calculus for all types sigma and tau for which K is a valid combinator to be applied on types of uh, on type sigma and tau, you will require new combinators one for each sigma tau combination. So, all these combinators are all going to be, uh, so each combinator of the untyped lambda calculus is going to be multiplied an infinite number of types, in an infinite number of times to cater to each of the infinite number of types that are now generated. But if you look at the code of this combinator, and in fact, what happens is let me we have been we have been up in the sky for a long time. So, maybe let us. So, what happens is that in most programming languages, the statically typed languages like Pascal and Modula actually use this simple typing scheme for their functions and procedures. Yeah. And people claim that C uses it. But C has a lot of dangerous things which also do not use it. For example, this returning void as a in a function is not really is not something that is really statically typable. It is it is actually an untyped form, which is why you can do a lot of uh, you can you can do a lot of uh, manipulation of types using those voids and using pointers in C. Okay. But for whatever is actually declared. C does use the simple typing scheme that we have seen in the lambda calculus. Okay. So, languages like Lisp, well they do allow integers and so on and so forth as types, but mostly Lisp is really an untyped language. If you remove all the data types from Lisp and look upon pure <coughs> Lisp as a version of the lambda calculus, then it is really untyped. There is absolutely no type checking mechanism, there is no type inferencing mechanism and there is no worry about whether you are applying some combinator to some argument which you should not be applying. So, it is mostly untyped, it is just that most of is implicitly once you have typed data, the type data, the underlying data type is well typed, then that typing uh, often works for most of our runtime environment. Okay, so, where as long as the values are from those data types, the, the, the typing works mainly because of the representation. Uh, the representations are nicely ensured on the machine which ensure that you get reasonable values. So, and what holds for Lisp also holds for scheme and uh, C with its void construct is actually going into the untyped territory of the lambda calculus. Yeah? So, most of these untyped languages simply do not bother about typing <coughs> though it is an important uh, way of catching, uh, catching bugs at a very early stage. Uh, so, uh, and it is becoming more and more important. 
so the so so uh, so most languages so though i haven't yet spoken about named functions and procedures i have spoken about named uh, i have spoken about unnamed functions and unnamed uh, unnamed blocks so far but essentially if you take all those blocks and give them a name you get your named functions and procedures and of course you should allow parameterization which is something we'll do later we'll, we'll which will start immediately after sometime after this so now the next question is so, so what we started out in the simply type lambda calculus was that self application is really meaningless and no self respecting mathematician will use self application. But long a long time ago we actually looked at this combinator twice and if you remember what we did was we Firstly, so a version of twice for the simply type lambda calculus would be something like this, right? I mean, I have for the bound variables, I have to specify types, so I have done that. Otherwise, I have made no other changes in, in the definition of twice, yeah. So, this twice, of course, uh, because of the typing constraint, I have to give, since x is applied to y, I have to give x a type of something arrow sigma. But since x is applied to that, the result of that, uh, I have given it a type sigma arrow sigma and y a type sigma, so that, so that it is well typed. So, this is actually a well typed uh, expression, yeah, yeah, but now the point is what about twice twice? I mean we had actually looked at this application also, okay. The moment you put these type constraints on the simply type lambda calculus, twice twice is no longer well typed, okay. If you remember the fact that the sigma, each of these sigmas is something of the form arrow, 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 arrow which ends up in a bool or an int. You at once rea you at once find that twice applied to twice is not well typed. Okay, and but we actually applied it and we got some nice results. The next question is we actually applied it and got some nice results. So is twice applied to twice actually meaningful? I mean, I mean, is there something? Are we being too restrictive? I mean, is it is it becoming like? Uh, is it becoming like a dictatorship? You know, to put in simple typing and disallow things like this. And when we applied twice to twice, we actually got some results, right. You remember we got the octupling function or whatever twice is applied several times, all that made perfect sense. So, what it means is that it means it means that all self, self applications need not necessarily be meaningless. I mean, uh, it's true. I mean, you can't apply a function from real numbers to real numbers to itself. It's not going to type. <coughs> but there are enough functions, like twice, which look meaningful. I mean, wh what does what does twice do? It just takes any function as an argument. And for any argument that that function might have, twice applies that function twice. I mean, that's that's really all it does, which is perfectly meaningful. I mean, after all, uh, given given a real number x uh, and f f is a function from real numbers to real numbers, f applied to f applied to x is perfectly meaningful, right? I mean, this there's no problem with that. And what all I am doing by specifying twice is that I am saying you take any arbitrary function f on real numbers and apply it twice on whatever argument you get. I do not care what function on real numbers you are taking, but whatever it is you just apply it twice and then give me the result. So, twice is a nice higher order function it is and it is actually in some sense type independent. And there are lots of, lots of such functions. 
And the important question that actually arises as part of all this is what is ML's view on types? Secondly, there is another important question. I said the identity function you are going to have infinite copies of the identity function. I mean just imagine just in order to give you back what you gave me, I require an infinite number of copies We check what type it is, send it to the appropriate copy and then send you back the same thing, right. So you got, I mean so this and what about the code that you, that is going to be written for something like the identity function. Regardless of the type of the argument, the code is going to remain identical. <coughs> There is no difference at all. What is the code? Essentially what the code says is take it and give it back. I mean that is that is really all that the code says. Take it and give it back even without looking at it. But your simple typing scheme actually puts a restriction. It says take it, look at it and only if it is compatible with you send it back. Otherwise do not. So I will require an array of infinite number of programs which do nothing but take and give back. And we are actually got this problem for a whole lot of programming problems. For example, what about the cons of integer lists? Should the cons of integer lists be different from the cons for character lists? Should the cons for integer lists and character lists be really any different from cons for lists of integer lists or lists of character lists or lists of lists of integer lists, lists of lists of character lists and so on and so forth. Right. Assuming that your base data type could have such an infinite num collection, then your type, your simple typing does not, it only creates more problems, it creates a tedium, you will have to create copies where only the type name is changed. You will have to create an on demand, whenever you get a new copy, you will have to create a new program in which the type is changed. This is the problem with Pascal. For example, whether if, if you d d define stacks of <coughs> integers, you cannot use that program for stacks of characters, you cannot use that program for stacks of strings, you cannot use that program for stacks of records of something of the other. Though the actual stack operations pop, push and empty are going to be identical in all these cases. And the reason in Pascal and, um, uh, and Modula and so on, you cannot do it is because they use a simply typed scheme. A simple typing scheme which requires an infinite number of copies where only the types of the bound variables have to be changed, okay. And whereas in ML, in Lisp you do not require it because it is untyped, it does not care what type you get. I mean, so that is essentially the difference between the typing in ML and Lisp or uh, ML and scheme because ML and scheme are both statically uh, scoped languages, they are easy to compare. In, in scheme you can do uh, cons of for any kind of type, but that is because all types are regarded as being just the same type, as being typeless. So you can do cons of integer, the same cons is apl applicable to uh, integer lists, integer, integer star integer lists, uh, character star character lists, uh, integer list star list of integer lists and so on and so forth. But that is because the cons in scheme is typeless, it is essentially like the untyped lambda calculus and so it does not care what the argument is. In ML the cons is the same except that it is typed, it is what is known as a polymorphic type, okay. So you use the same code but now our base types were type constants. What you require are type variables which are going to be instantiated on demand, yeah. So type variables are required. What we are saying is that if you look at the cons operation, then for all types as long as they are types of the form something list for all types t such that an argument is of type t and another argument is of type t list, it is possible to do a cons of the type uh, object of type t 
with the list of type T list and I require the same piece of code. I require only one copy of cons for that. I do not require an infinite number of copies. Yeah. So, this polymorphism, so we look at the polymorphic lambda calculus where we actually move from we actually move from the simply typed to the parametrically typed and uh, this polymorphism is what is present in C++ and ADA as generics. So, in so for example, you define the stacks, you define stacks in ADA, you use a type variable which is not going to be instantiated okay? and you write all the code for the stack operations pop, push, checking emptiness and so on and the compiler compiles it. You call this code for producing stacks of integers, stacks of characters, stacks of records, whatever, but at the call to this code, the variable, the type variable is initialized to integer to the type, type variables are different from value variables, right. So, you have a notion of type variables which are different from value variables which can be instantiated on a call. And so, you produce particular instances of the same code for the same type. More, the simplest implementation of course, is that instead of you writing the code for integer stacks, real stacks, character stacks and so on separately, you write it as a generic package in ADA or C++ and the compiler will produce code for, where, for whatever type you are demanding those operations to be used. It will actually replicate the code by changing the type variable and putting that base type that you are enter entering that. That is that's in fact, most what most ADA compilers do, they actually replicate the entire code for that call. But it is also possible to use reentrant code, use the same code with the type variable instantiated which is what we ML does. Yeah, you can use reentrant code without actually generating new code. So, we will talk about polymorphism in the next class.